was Thomas Kincaid's Christmas Cottage, and then one I'm very fond of because of its Missouri connection, the way I wrote for many years to this radio show, Prairie Home Companion, and I helped Garrison write uh, the, the movie, Prairie Home Companion, which was Robert Altman's last film. And uh, as who knows where Robert Altman grew up? Kansas City. Kansas City. So fellow Missourian, and that was uh, certainly a very high point for me. But most of the 25 years I've spent in hour-long television. And um, it is, frankly, with all due respect to our screen, pure screenwriting friends, who I think will get lured into television eventually, <laughs> uh, uh, it is where the jobs are nowadays. It is also, I think, where the most interesting work is happening nowadays. Um, it is the writer's medium. In screenplay, in the world of screenplay, um, there is evolved, uh, didn't always used to be this way, but there's evolved that this sort of notion of the, it is a director's medium. And the director has sort of final say on, on much of what happens in the world of the movie. Um, in TV, it is a writer's medium. A writer will almost always pitch the show. You know, Vince Gilligan pitched Breaking Bad. He's the writer. He wrote, you know, he's the showrunner. Um, which means, and the showrunner, I guess I'm getting a little bit of the structure of how TV gets produced. People know when I say showrunner what that term means. So it's sort of like, you know, this is a little, some people do, some people don't. The showrunner, I like to say, is the closest thing the modern world has to the ruler of a medieval duchy. It is that person who is all powerful. And I had the good fortune in my career to work with this guy named Jeff Melvoin when I was writing on Army Wives. And Jeff is the sort of acknowledged master of showrunning. And um, he actually runs the Writers Guild, has a program for mid-level writers who need to learn the skills to become showrunners. And Jeff created that program 10 years ago and runs it. Um, so he's like this master of showrunning. The thing about a showrunner is everything. It's amazing how many responsibilities fall on a showrunner's shoulders. So Vince Gilligan, showrunner for Breaking Bad. So he writes, he gets the idea, he writes the pilot. Um, once the show is, is up and running, his job is first and foremost to supervise the writing of the scripts, to make sure that the scripts and the story of the whole series are his vision. He will typically write, oftentimes showrunners get too busy to write more than an episode or so a year, but they will usually write at least one episode a year. Um, but way beyond that. So he supervises the hiring of the writing staff. And a writing staff on a TV show, um, when you see end credits and you see all these producers' credits on TV shows, those are mostly writers, executive producers. Um, the showrunner will always have an executive producer title. Um, you'll see a co-executive producer. That's like as oftentimes the second in command. Uh, you'll see a bunch of producers on really long, like my brother Rob writes for The Simpsons. And The Simpsons has been on for so long that it's like everybody has <laughs> executive producer titles or co-executive producer titles. But they're all writers. They all are, uh, you know, the, the titles of a writer as you go up the scale on television, as you start out as a baby writer at the staff writer level, then there's this position called story editor, which is, it used to be more significant. Now it's just kind of a, a name that is a bump in usually salary. In the old days, um, in the old days of television, all right, I'll talk about how television writing evolved a little bit. Um, it's important to remember that television evolved really not from film, but from radio. Um, I don't think, I, I'm probably the one person, I don't know, I've had this weird career where I've actually written for radio. I mean, for Garrison, you know, for Prairie Home Companion. Um, but it's interesting because radio, which was a huge, huge event in American life in the 20s, 30s, 40s, into the 50s, you know, radio shows were a staple of entertainment. And most of early television were radio shows, Burns and Allen, uh, The Lone Ranger. These were all things that were on radio that got transferred into television. Radio organized itself around 15-minute segments. Some radio shows were just 15 minutes long. Um, but in the world of television, they all quickly, and most of them were half an hour, so they mostly became half hour or hour long shows. And I just mention this because the phenomena of thinking about a TV show, again, I'm, I'm going back in history, it's different now, but the classic TV formulation was four acts. 
four x is a teaser, four x, and a tag is what kind of the classic TV structure was for many, many years. Changed now, but Breaking Bad, as you'll see, classic four x structure. Um, the uh, that evolved from radio, and also with it, and this is something you'll really note in many TV scripts. Uh, and it's an economic reason, is a reliance on dialogue as opposed to film. In other words, cinema films are moving pictures, right? They, they tell their story uh, visually, at least a good movie does. You know, the idea is always, how can you tell this visually? Television, an hour-long television show, is often, again, not always, nowadays, like Game of Thrones, a whole different set of rules, but in, in standard television, oftentimes you're shooting a, a one hour show, which translates to 43 minutes of screen time, in eight days. So all right, how do you shoot something in eight days where you're shooting seven pages a day or eight pages a day? Because most TV scripts are 54-ish pages long for an hour long standard. Again, I'm, again it, it, this is where it gets tricky nowadays because with the advent of you know, Amazon and Hulu and, and Netflix and HBO, there's a lot of, it's like kind of a, a lot of variations to this. But I'm sort of talking about a general me, uh, a general sort of overview of, of classic television. Um, how do you shoot eight pages a day? Well, you have more dialogue. You can't, you know, it takes a long time to set up the shot of the searchers and the woman looking out through the door, and here comes John Wayne riding on a horse. And you know, like in a movie, you have the budget and the time to, um, you know, to shoot two to three pages a day. TV, you've got to crank out seven or eight pages a day. Well, how do you do that? Well, in part. You have scenes that are more dialogue driven because you can, you know, shoot a, a two-person dialogue scene more rapidly and, and tell the story through dialogue. So television tends to be more, more, not necessarily always re, uh, reliant on dialogue. And I would, I oftentimes think this is actually because historically its derivative was radio, um, but it's it's mostly economic. Um, okay, I digressed. Uh, back to the structure of, of how a TV show gets written. Um, again, the, your first job as a, as a TV writer is the staff writer. You're sort of the baby writer on the, on the show. Um, what that means is that oftentimes that there is a writer's room which consists of, again, it varies wildly, but let's just say eight, <coughs> eight-ish people. Um, and the staff writer is sort of the baby writer, the person who is newest to the world of television writing. The next step up on the food chain is story editor. Uh, in the old days, this is what got me started up the old days, story editor was a different position. Um, in the beginning days of television, there were no staffs per se. There would be a showrunner, the person who ran the show, who did much more writing than they do nowadays. Um, and there would be a story editor who actually had this official position of taking pitches from freelance writers. And so the story editor would sit there all day long and hear a string of writers pitch stories for Gunsmoke and say, yeah, I like that story. You know, I'll, let's take it to the uh, showrunner. And then that freelance writer would write an episode of Gunsmoke. Um, by writer skilled regulations, each show nowadays has to take, I guess if you're doing 22, two freelance scripts a year the reality is those scripts almost always go to the writer's assistant. It's like a chance for the writer's assistant to make that first move up into, up the food chain. Um, so uh, story editor used to be this significant position, breaks my heart, but Clifford Odets ended his life, his last job was as a story editor on Gunsmoke, uh, the great playwright Clifford Odets. But it was a significant job back then. It wasn't like just a story editor. And then you go on up the chain to um, like co-producer, producer. Once you get a producer into your title, theoretically, you now get a chance to become involved in production. That is to say, you get a chance to have a hand in talking about casting, talking about budgeting. The reality is, in a writer's room, it's pretty generally, it's pretty collegial. And anybody with a great idea is, you know, the great idea is a great idea. Um, you have producer, then you have co-executive producer, executive producer. Um, so 
there is a hierarchy, and I just mentioned this because all of these titles that you see on TV shows, these are writers. Again, my point is, it's a writer's medium. Um, and so, uh, how does a writer's room break a story? Um, can I digress for one moment? All right. Uh, because I just, before I forget, um, sorry, this is a blatant plug. Yes. So I realize that people may not, in this room, may not realize. I run a low residency MFA in TV and screenwriting in Hollywood on behalf of Stevens College. Awesome. Our mission is, oh, there we go. Okay. Inside the book, inside yeah. cover. Yeah. Thank you. And our mission is to get more women writing for TV and film. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, these up in, inside the book. There is, uh, this actually has my email address. Okay. So, anyway. Oh. Okay. Well, I hope I took enough. I hope I brought enough. Um, so, uh, thank you, thank you for indulging this blatant advertisement. Um, so, how do writers in a TV room construct a story? What I'm about to do is this ridiculous miniaturization and shorthand of how this process goes. Actually, you know what helped me? Can we put this table up just real quick? So, the writer's room. Okay. So the writer's room, a typical writer's room, is kind of ringed by either bulletin boards or white erase boards. These big boards, and you'll see all kinds of story beats put out of them. What I'm about to do is this ridiculous, oh thank you, this ridiculous short-term version of how that process goes, just so we can just to sort of do a rough illustration. Um, it starts with index cards. The index card was invented around 1760 by the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus. And he did so because he was trying to classify plants. And he wanted to try to create a system where you could get a piece of information and then file it and then move it around, have a sort of portable piece of information. And the essence of this notion that this index card represents a portable piece of information has passed off down through a lot of writers, John McPhee writes all of his nonfiction books just using index cards. It is um, in writer's room up till today, it is still kind of what most people use to break a story. I had never heard the term breaking a story until I moved to Hollywood 25 years ago. And at first I thought it sounded terribly destructive. Like a bunch of writers would sit around in the room and take a perfectly good story and destroy it. <laughs> but what it actually means is to break a story into its component parts, its little pieces, and try to construct something that is imaginative and moving and hopefully ends up on television. So um, here in miniature, this is such a crazy little experiment, is the process that I would say people use to break a story in Hollywood. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this into this insanely huge writer's room for a moment. And let's pretend that we have an hour-long drama. And let's pretend that our hour-long drama, Amy's done this, is dramatizing the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, right? You know, we all know this kind of fairy tale. And because it's, we're at Stevens College, we'll say it's Jackie and the Beanstalk. So we have a female protagonist. Um, and just to review, because you know, what happens in a writer's room is you have you have a show like Breaking Bad. Writers come in every morning, and somebody might say, "Oh, I just heard this story about a meth dealer, you know, in, in Missouri." Battles. And you know, this, I think this would be good for our show. Or, and this is even more common. You know, my son said something to me this morning that really struck me, and and then people start talking about it. And I was, "Wait, there's a story there in this father-son relationship." Um, so let's pretend that I've just walked into this writer's room and I've said, "You know what?" We're all hired now to write the pilot of Jackie and the Beanstalk. And here's the basic story, and we're gonna to try to break this story because there's a lot of different ways you can tell this story. So just to review, the basic story of Jack and the Beanstalk is you have a mother and a daughter, again, the same Jackie, who live in an impoverished farm. The one possession they have is Milky the cow. This is their treasured possession, this one cow. Um, things are really bad. Right, they're in deep, deep trouble, and Milky the cow stops giving milk. So there's no more milk for Milky the cow. Um, and the mother says to Jackie, you know what, you're gonna have to go to market and sell Milky the cow. On the road to the market, Jackie meets 
a little old man, and the little old man says, you know what? I will give you five magic beans in exchange for your cow. And Jackie's intrigued by this and says, yes, I'll do that, and takes the magic beans, returns home. Her mother, being an adult and not understanding these things, says, what? You sold our cow for five beans? And infuriated, hurls the beans out of the window and sends Jackie to bed without dinner, because they have no food anyway. <laughs> we didn't have any money anyway, so, she, she. so Jackie wakes up in the morning, and there's this enormous beanstalk that goes all the way up into the clouds. Oh my gosh, wow, um, here's an inciting event, right? Actually, the inciting event, I'd say, would be um, the sale of the cow. But here's a, well, I won't even get into that breaking axe. Um, here's this event, this beanstalk. Jackie takes action, right? Our hero is an active hero. She wants something. She wants to save her family farm. Um, she has to do it now because they're starving. And if she doesn't succeed in somehow saving the farm, she'll lose everything. So she climbs up the beanstalk. And she gets up into this land of the clouds. And she sees in the distance a castle. And she goes into the castle. It turns out to be a giant castle. And there is the giant sitting at the table with Mrs. Giant. And the giant says, fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an English woman. <laughs> be, was it be she, uh, <coughs> Thank you. So, we know what the giant says. And then the giant falls asleep. And now Jackie says, I have a chance here. I have a, I have a chance to, because she sees there's a lot of wealth scattered around this, this giant's castle. And so Jackie, First class seizes, is it the bag of gold? Is it, there's, yes, the bag, I'm gonna say a bag of gold. She seizes a bag of gold and races off. And the giant wakes up, realizes, I may have the bag a little wrong, but that's all right. Seizes the bag of gold, races off. And the giant realizes that something is wrong and chases uh, and wakes up, but it's too late. Jackie's gone, she's down the beanstalk. Now, theoretically, the problems are solved. She has these big gold, gold coins from the giant. Her family now has all the money it needs. But, and here's where we can as a group end up talking about story, either the mother gets greedy, either Jackie gets greedy, something happens and Jackie decides, Jackie's impulsive. Again, it's all about character. Story, 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 story is character. What is Jackie's character that she ends up going back up the beanstalk? And she goes back up the beanstalk, sneaks into the castle. Once again, the giant thinks he smells the blood of an English woman. The giant test says, Mrs. Giant says, no, no, it's all fine, it's all fine. He falls asleep, and this time, Jackie steals the goose that lays the golden eggs. And again, manages to escape. Once again, now she's back home. She's got, now she's got a bag of gold coins. She's got a goose that's laying a golden egg every day. You would think this would be enough, right? <laughs> but no, she decides to go up one more time. And this time she goes up, again the giant thinks he smells something wrong. She steals the harp, the singing harp. And as she's carrying the harp away, the singing of the harp wakes up the giant. The giant pursues Jackie. There's a race for the beanstalk. Jackie starts down the beanstalk, yelling to her mother, get me the ax, get me the ax, chop down the bean, gotta chop down the beanstalk. And as the giant starts descending the beanstalk, Jackie chops the beanstalk, the beanstalk falls down, killing the giant. And Jackie and her mother live happily ever after. Which, if you think about it, is a strange sort of moral for the story. It's like, the thief and the murderer end up <laughs> very much <laughs> wrong. Um, so I've always been intrigued. So I think it's an interesting story on many levels because it's a um, story of morality and a story of greed, maybe. A story of, and then you know what? This is, I just heard this on, by the way, great for every writer, every artist in the room. There's this interesting documentary on HBO called The Defiant Ones about Dr. Dre and, and, uh, and Jimmy Iovine. And there's this point which Jimmy Iovine, I think, says, everybody loves the story of somebody who's got nothing and is trying to make it. And I thought, that's Jackie the Beat. That is, it's so true. It's like 
somebody who has nothing and wants to make it is always compelling. Here's Jack, got nothing and really wants to make it. That's all right, this is fine. We're right now. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so I think that's a really, really interesting story. Now, if we were a writer's group, and let's just say, for the sake of it, that we're breaking the story of the pilot of this show, what we would try to do is identify, because the way hour-long TV, again, classically is structured, is you have an A story. The A story is the big story, the main story. It's usually the story of our hero or heroine. You know, tracking that person through, just what that happens to that person. It's the A story. Um, there's a B story, which is slightly lesser. It's like the secondary character, the secondary hero of our story. You know, track, and and, and um, I should note there are some TV shows now where it's all A story. You know, the, things have changed. But generally, you have an A story, you have a B story, who's the secondary hero, and then oftentimes you have a C story, which is this tertiary figure, um, significantly less involved in the story, but intersects the hero at various points. And then oftentimes you'll have a runner. The runner is just that little, and sometimes it's a comic thing that happens once an act. The classic television structure is to break a story into a teaser and four acts and often a tag. So the way that a television writer's room works, roughly, and it all depends on who's running it and all of this, is people will oftentimes say, all right, let's look, by the way, all right, caveat. Some people would prefer to say, all right, let's first figure out our act breaks. Because in television, the act break is crucial. Um, because it's very much like the sequence approach. It very much goes back to that notion of every, whatever, 10, 12 minutes, there's a commercial break. And again, this is, again, I'm going back to old school stuff, because nowadays, obviously, on Google or whatever, you don't have these commercial breaks. But the rhythm remains the same. Every 10 minutes, you'll have a commercial break. In old school television, you had to do something interesting at the commercial break to draw the audience back after the commercial. And the general sort of lay of the land was act one had to set up the problem of our hero. What is the problem? And the act ends with, here's a twist now that deepens the problem. How is the hero going to solve this? Um, and it's very much like the, the sort of film structure, where act two, same deal. Now the hero has to deal with a heightened problem. And by the way, act one defines the problem. This is very important. Act one defines the problem. Act two, um, <coughs> the hero, yes? What do you mean by that? Defines the problem? Yeah, act one has to define the problem. So for instance, <laughs> in Breaking Bad, since we've mostly seen it, like we know by the end of act one, we have this interesting teaser, which we'll see, and then we, by the end of act one, we know, oh my gosh, we have our hero, Brian Cranston, who is dying of cancer, How and his family needs money. He's working this shitty job as a, in a car wash. So you know that they're, it's never stated, but it's clear that they really need money. And now he's dying of cancer. That's a problem. What's going to happen to my family after I am dead? So we've defined the problem that he has to grapple with. How is he going to handle this problem? Um, yeah. And, and you're saying that defines the problem for like the series? <coughs> for this episode. Yeah. For this episode. It's like, I mean, in, in Breaking Bad, interestingly enough, it actually does define the problem for the whole series. Um, I mean, that's his problem. It's like, uh, I, I will digress a moment to note, all right, since we're talking about it, this is interesting, because <laughs> this book that I highly recommend, Bill Rapkin's book, Writing the Pilot, yes. the thing that he really explores is the idea of theme in a TV show. So he would ask you the question, like, what is a TV show? Uh, I'll just answer it Bill. And Bill's answer would be, a TV show is a theme restated every week. In Breaking Bad, the theme, one would argue, is how far will a good man go toward the dark side before he himself <coughs> becomes bad? How far will he, will he go in pursuit of something good before he himself becomes bad? So he starts off with this noble aim. I'm going to take care of my family. And I'm going to do it in this dicey way by dealing drugs. But I'm doing it for this noble cause. 
how far, and every week we see how far will he go in that pursuit before he himself becomes bad. And the whole show, obviously, is breaking bad. Each week, like The Shield, people remember that show. You have this cop who's like, how he thinks he's doing good. He's trying to beat criminals. But how far will he go to the doing evil things to these criminals in, in the name of justice before he himself becomes a bad person? Each week, you see a restatement of that theme. The problem remains the same. The theme remains the same. So each so TV shows tend to have good ones, tend to have a very strong basis. Like, the, for instance, the show I wrote on, which was a different kind of show, it's an anthology show, for many years was Touched by an Angel. And if anybody saw Touched by an Angel, it was so simple, but it was, I'm convinced this theme was why people kept tuning back. Because the theme of that show, for those who had, had watched it, there's angels who help people who had problems. And that each week what you'd see is here's a human being with a profound problem, and at some point they will get the message that God loves them and it will help them deal with that problem. It won't necessarily solve the problem, but it will help them deal with the problem. And so it's a very simple theme. It seems like people don't realize this, but God actually loves them even though they screw up. And each week, and that was because it was an anthology, it was like a blatant restatement of that theme each week. Um, so does that answer your question? <coughs> Concerns y'all. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've read the book that uh, William Mackin wrote and, and the other one that you wrote with this writing partner. Yeah. And I have a terrible memory, so I read them multiple times a year. Um, so, so I understand the concept of, like, I think what you're talking about is the franchise, right? Yeah. Right? Um, but I think. I think my question is, are you are you saying that um, in the pilot, in Act 1, that that's where we set up that theme that defines every episode or defines the series? Or, or are you just saying for this pilot, this one episode? Or I would say that the, whether or not you do it in Act 1, it is essential to set up the theme in the pilot. By the end of the pilot, the audience, whether they know it or not, there is a theme that has been set up. I, I, my, my point about what Act One does, this is kind of old school television. In old school television, Act One will define the problem that the show's addressing. A man has been killed. Who is the murderer? You know, like that's kind of a classic Act One setup of a problem. You know, Act Two, uh, the search for the murderer seems to lead to an answer, um, but at the end of the middle of the, at the end of act two, it's like that's not the right answer. The end of act three is like the dark night of the soul moment in screenplays. The end of act three is like, oh my gosh, this is a horrible mess, it will never get resolved, and act four finds a resolution. That's a very simplistic way to look at the four acts of the TV show. Um, so returning to, all right, so how do you actually work this out in the writer's room? Um, and so thank you, because I just realized, this all started with, there were at least some people say, well, let's talk about what our act breaks are. And that's not a bad way to start. It's like, all right, what are the act breaks? What's the, the moment that we know is going to end act one? Maybe it's like Jack goes up to Jackie, goes up the beanstalk. That, you know, you, sometimes you start talking like that way. Um, the way I think I've seen it done that I'd like to propose we do a mini, mini experiment up here is let's talk about our A story. And let's just say, throw out some, and we, We'll get probably as far as like act one. So let's just say, just off the top of your head, what are some beats, like a story beat that Jackie, so, oh, well, first of all, what is the A story? Who's the hero of this? Jackie. Jackie. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah, so that's pretty good. So, so just throw out some ideas, like what would be, like, with the beginning of this show, what, and, and you know what, I'm gonna jump over huge things, such as two days of discussing the world of this show. <laughs> like, so please understand. So I'm jumping over, is this show take place in fairy tale land? Does this show take place in depression America? Do we make this a show like a transfer to New York City in the 1980s? And Jackie's living on the Lower East Side. Um, 
let's, all right, somebody just throw out an idea of like, where do you want this series to take place? Missouri. Missouri, oh, of course, what am I doing, what am I doing? Missouri, all right, this is a farm in Missouri, of course, of course, let's, like, let's make it the farm just outside of Columbia, just south of Columbia, and what time period do we say? Like present? Depression. Depression. 1930s. Depression, okay, this is good, because people were really hurting in the 30s. So, Depression era, farm in Missouri, all right, great. All right, so let's just go with that and say, all right, now we, we're gonna track just from the start of her adventures. What's, what's some things that Jackie would do? What's, what's a beat for Jackie? Like the, you gotta have the poverty or the starving. So we have to show poverty. So how would we show, how would we dramatize poverty? Like empty the, cupboard. Empty cupboard, all right, so I'll just say. The dust bowl, just the whole thing. Just like cupboard. Yeah. Oh, nothing to eat tonight. Yeah. Jackie looks at the shop window, she can't buy the donut. <laughs> Alright, so we'll say nothing to eat. Um, I'm gonna say because it's a farm, maybe we'll we'll say we'll just go with there's nothing to eat. Um, great, okay. Uh, what what happens to Jackie next? Right, realize the cow doesn't make any milk. So Milky is out of milk. <laughs> okay, Milky, and you'll just see I'm just throwing on these um, cards. And then people won't be able to see it in the back. But this is just like kind of the headline of what that what that moment is. We have an empty cupboard, we have nothing to eat, Milky's out of milk. I do have a question now. Yeah. Why wouldn't he just why wouldn't he, why wouldn't he just eat a cow? Well, all right, <laughs> this, this is a great writer's room question. Let's talk, let's take a moment and say, why wouldn't they eat the cow? So I'm curious that thing. What would we do afterwards? So, yeah, right. So we're saying you can eat the cow, but then you know that's the dead end. How about another emotional the reason? Emotional why attachment. Would you, what was that? The emotional attachment to the cow. Yeah, the emotional cow. attachment to the cow. So why would that sell it? Well, but if you're selling it, at least you're not killing it yourself. Right? <laughs> Something to do with the father, but it's not there. Ah, and here's a great point right. because this is this is the big issue in this house. Since Where is the father? <laughs> and our ideas about that. Yes. Yeah, Lord. Lord. Louis for work. Ah, okay. Father is in St. I'm just going to write this down. I was going to say, Father in St. Louis looking for work. He died in the war. So there's another possibility. Um, all right, so one possibility is in St. Louis looking for work. Another possibility he died in World War One. We, we have. Um, um, I like, I like, I, I personally sort of, by the way, this is what a showrunner would do. A showrunner would say, oh, yeah, the father died in World War I. He's in St. Louis looking for work. It's the showrunner's job to just sort of, arb not arbitrarily, but be the vision that says, you know what, I like the idea he's in St. Louis looking for work unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. So it's like a sad, tragic situation. Yeah? The dads argue with the banks coming to repossess the property. Okay, oh, this is good. So we have, we'll say, I'll just put bank, I'll just say bank comes to re, will, I'll say will repossess. So we know that this is, this, that, uh, I don't know how you spell repossess, repo. <laughs> <laughs> repo. repo. There you go, thank you. How many S's? How many S's? Um, which is good because this sets up the stakes. This sets up why now, all right, because the farm's about to be lost. Um, so, uh, on the same point, yeah. uh, for the very first one, like uh, repos, uh, mail, they say eviction notice, repossession. Eviction notice, which is, which is sort of this, this moment, on I the think. Same, on yeah. The, on the very first one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's nice because, by the way, um, uh, we've set up nice steaks here. Um, all right, so now we got, we milky's out of milk. We know that the, we'll set up maybe the father in St. Louis looking for work. What else? What other things are, what happens next? Yeah. Jackie's a hopeless optimist among the cow. So we'll just put down Jackie. So this is a character note, optimist, loves cows. So she, to, she has to be gullible, too. What's that? She has to be gullible. Or, ima or at least ma imaginative to the point where she believes things that... Oh, so, oh, oh yes, yes. So, so, <laughs> so this is actually a good point. He, what he's saying is she has to be gullible. So, she, yeah. so this is a character note, yeah. that she loves this cow, she has this active imagination, so she's willing to buy into the notion of magic beans. Yeah. All right, so we know we have, and so this, she loves the cow. This is like a moment. We'll show this visually. This will be a visual, you know, moment with the cow, which I think will be very nice. What happens next? 
Uh, when, or, uh, yeah, let's go. How about the mother can't take the cow and Jack has to because the mother's sick? Oh, nice. Okay, we'll say mother's sick. Sick. Jackie has to take cow, which explains why Jackie's doing it instead of the mother. Because the mother wanted to kill the cow. jump over this this scene to me there's a, there should be a scene right where the mother tells Jackie we must sell the cow mm -hmm. I mean that to me seems like uh, an but, but, emotional since, thing. but since she's sympathetic you know the cow has sympathetic value the she has Jack has, Jackie has to be you know assured that nothing when she sells the cow to this person that nothing's gonna happen to the cow so is the mother lying to Jackie well because you know she says you know the mother wants to kill the cow you know and she's has the, the, the cow has no value to Jackie, wouldn't she, if she sells it to this guy for these beans, she would want to be assured that. So that's part of the guy's yeah, sale. Yeah, part of the, yeah, Sorry, yeah. So when we get there, that'll be part yeah, of the yeah. sales pitch. All right, so yes. Like when we go with something different where it, the cow got hurt, something happened at the farm, broke a leg, obviously the cow can still get milk, but he can't because you got to put him out. And so now there's a time limit where it's take the cow, same thing so, with why don't you eat it because yeah. you can sell it and get money to buy, you know, right. a new cow yeah. eventually. So, here, so that's an interesting idea. So, you know, there, and this is a great thing about the writers' room. Like, there's really like there's no bad ideas. It's just an interest. There's all it's a million different ways to tell a story. So that's an interesting idea. I would argue that it's more poignant actually if the choice is dependent on the family's financial situation as opposed to the cow. Because if the cow's injured then one way or the other, it's gotta be put down. And so this way, I want to see the, the, the family make the choice. I wanna see Jackie and the mother have to be forced to make a choice. Because really, writing is always about having your characters make choices. And the more you can have the characters make choices, I think, rather than be forced into things, the better it is. Um, all right, so uh, I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm just gonna throw up a mother says sell cow. Um, all right, and then what happens next? Uh, on her way, she to sell the cow. She meets the traveler with the beans. So Jackie meets traveler with beans. Um, and. I'm gonna, we're just gonna work a little bit in, well, maybe work just as far as like uh, selling the cow and throwing the beans out the window. So, so all right, so beans travel with beans. Now what, we wanna talk about this traveler for a minute. Like, how do we wanna portray this traveler as? Is he our sea story? Is, what's that? Is our traveler our sea story? Is our shifty salesman, is he gonna be a reoccurring character? Let's talk about that. I think that's a totally valid idea that maybe, maybe how many people would say yes, the traveler should be the sea story? Should be yes, show of hands? Yeah. 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 Liking? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, all right, so, all right, so this is significant then. So the traveler's gonna be the sea story and he's gonna be re recurring. So question, do we, this is now we get into the point of view question. Um, so right now we're, point of view is Jackie and her mother, right? We're sort of staying with them. Here's options for storytelling. Let's say the traveler is going to be our sea story. Conceivably, we could cut to the traveler and show our audience something about the traveler. We could change our point of view. Thoughts? Should we have yeah. conning? Perhaps like we're, we're, we're led down the path of the traveler is a con man? Okay. He's um, at that old lady's house with all the shoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so could we characterize the cow and the cow doesn't eat, knowing it would be sold, so that, you know, can, connecting the two, the, the, the strange traveler. But the cow knows it's going to be sold. Well, so no. It's a fairy tale, man. Maybe it's not a cow. 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 It's
Yeah, right. This, all right, this is a great issue. This is the great issue of the world of this show. In the world of this show, can cows have consciousness? Because we're going to go up a beanstalk and yes. encounter giants. Yes. <laughs> so it seems like that's a possibility. So, yes, I want to catch this in. So um, you were saying how the father was unsuccessful with a job. Maybe the con man met the father and tried to get a job, and the con man just stole all the money. And we see where the father has been. And then the con man comes, and there's no Jackie now. Interesting. All right. Now, I'm going to do that. So this is like so many great ideas. Notice I'm going to now move to different colored cards because we're now talking about the, the traveler. We'll call him the con man. And if we let's go with this idea that rather than have a point of view that is um, strictly from Jackie and the mothers, let's just say let's play with it. the idea. Oh, maybe this is an omniscient point of view, and we're going to get to see the con man. Uh, and I'm moving to a different colored card because. Well, you'll see how this, why, the logic of this. But let's, let's take a couple of these con man ideas. We said potentially see con man with father, see con man with dad, and steals his money. I'll say dad in St. Louis <coughs> steals money. OK. And then do we want to see the con man? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So we'll say gave beans. Father would take the beans. These beans, these beans right here, are they are are they real magical beans or these are fake magical beans? So we assume that Jackie's will be fake too. Is that what you're saying? I mean, but apparently the the beans are magical if they're gonna grow that. So what? So what if he's a trickster? All right, hang on. This, this, you'll see, by the way, this is why there's usually like six to eight people in a writer's room. So let me, I know, we'll, we'll probably have people who will be going backwards and forwards, but I want to hear from as many people as we can. So let's do this. Let's, I know, he's had his hand up for a long time. She has. We'll go boom, 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 and then see where we're at. Then, okay, all right, so I think you'd have your hand up for a long time. So I'm saying, like, the con man should con somebody out of these beans, some, some wealthy person yeah. who maybe had the, the, the precursor to these beans, and now he's conned them out of them, and he just thinks they're beans, and so he's now conning this, our Jackie out of her cow with these worth, quote unquote worthless beans. Okay, great. So I'm writing it down con man cons rich person out of beans. Okay, and we went to the back. I like that idea because I was thinking, what if our con man isn't like a full con man or it's a little more complicated so that at least there's yes, something likable about him um, or her? <laughs> What, yeah, what if he was like uh, a guy or something? So, 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 interesting, this is a great point. So, humanize the con man. Very nice point. Always good to humanize more. I think we're going to go here. Uh, two points. One is uh, just to ask the question to the room Is the con man aware that the beans are magical? Or does he think he's conning out, out of beans? So, that's the question. Does, is he aware of it? And uh, my suggestion was going to be that uh, if he is a con man, and if he doesn't think the beans are magical, he's actually con, because he's struggling just as much as anybody, just in his way to make a living as the con, he considers the win is getting a whole cow for five beans. And that's the con. The con isn't, right. So, but, so your, your suggestion would be that he is not aware the beans are magical. Right, that would be my suggestion that he doesn't, that he's not aware. So before we go here, let's take a show of hands. How many people would vote for the con man is unaware, does not think the beans are magical? Oh, this is going to be like half and half, right? <laughs> How many people think the con man should be aware the beans are magical? You know what? I actually think a little bit more think that he should be aware of the dramatic All right. All right. So all right. let's continue our journey. I think we're going to go here and then here and then there. So, all right. So continue on here. What if we reveal that the con man is actually working for the giants? So after he gives her the five beans, he reveals he has a giant thing of beans. And he's just giving them to orphans all over the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in that, in that pitch... In that pitch, the con man is actually a good person, 
right? No, he is feeding giants. He's feeding giant orphans. He's sending them up to be. He likes to eat. Oh, I see. I see. So, oh, okay. All right. So, how many like? Before we get to you, just quickly, show of hands, how many like the idea that the con man is actually working for the giants, sending them orphans for them to eat? <laughs> and how many don't like that idea? All right, sorry. And, and by the way, by the way, I, sh I should note that in a real writer's room, it's not a democracy. <laughs> the showrunner would be just like, no, no, yes, yes. You know, I, it's, it's the showrunner's view. But this is a really interesting idea. Um, all right, I want to like circle up here because we had said you. I think the con man isn't a con man because if he knows the beans are magic, he's really trying to help the family. So he could be some kind of traveling good Samaritan. Some kind of entity. Oh, okay. like a right. So all right, another right. show of hands. How many people think the con man should actually be more like the traveling good Samaritan who's trying to do good things? That's the fantasy, right? Nobody. All right, no, I want to just, sorry, I know you had have your hand up a while ago. Okay, so the, the con man with the magic beans is going to sell them to Jackie. I think he should have conned the dad, and the dad got stuck up there. And that's what makes Jack go back. To oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, so wait. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is a really, I, I like this now. As, as showrunner, I'm going to make a couple executive decisions so we can sort of move forward. And by the way, this process would take days. I mean, I hope you realize that, like, you know, this is just like a little miniature sort of crazy quilt way of doing things that this is why you spend hours and hours and hours in a writing room beating out the story to try to, you know, because the, the, idea, of, uh, the idea of any script is I, 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 John Gardner, this great novelist, wrote this sort of treatise in the 70s about novels, that the idea was a great novel draws you into a sort of waking dream and you find yourself reading the book and then suddenly you realize an hour later you've been in the world of that novel. And it is a vivid and continuous dream that you've been drawn into. Screenplay and TV writing, the goal is the same. You've all been in movies where you're drawn into this vivid world of the movie. And the thing that draws you out is that bump. Like, you know, my son's in the military, and I've had so many military people tell me when they watch military movies, the, when they get the uniform off. Like, it just, all of a sudden, it's like, wait, this is just a movie. You know, it's like it totally draws you out of that world. Um, and um, so our goal as writers is to create, the, have a script that draws the reader in in a vivid and continuous dream. And a bump is, the, is a mistake in the writing. The trick is, it's a double trick for us screenplay and TV writers. Because our scripts aren't actually the finished product. A novel is the finished product. A poem is the finished product. Um, our scripts are blueprints for production. And so they have this dual purpose of trying to inspire somebody to <coughs> buy our script, right? To get so entranced with our script that they buy it. But then also, ultimately, for a director and a production team, an entire crew, to take this, these pieces of paper and translate them then into, um, you know, into the finished product. And there's this old adage that you know, things get written three times. You know, the writer writes it. It gets written again when it's being shot, and then the editing process, it gets written a third time. So it's for writers, by the way, this is again why television is the writer's medium, because the writer in television, at least the showrunner, is present in all of those stages. Even if the showrunner's not on the set, the showrunner will, will watch dailies and say, no, no, that's not right, you've got to do that again. Or there's always a writer, a staff writer, a show writer on the set of the episode being written to make sure that that vision is getting translated into the TV show. And then showrunners very often love to be in the edit room. And they'll, they'll work with the editors very closely. Um, so OK, so I'm going to say I love this idea of dad stuck in the clouds, because it gives a motivation. Um, OK, a couple more ideas on the con man. Uh, Can I ask a question about the showrunner thing? Oh, yeah, we, absolutely. Um, we in historian, how, um, who actually writes Yes. Yeah. Well, so here, here is the.
process. And actually, I will. Oh, maybe we're getting. We're kind of getting in. Is it new? Oh, yes. My God. And there, there's a Netflix documentary called Showrunners that you, if you're interested in learning more, I would highly recommend you watch that. And it actually takes you into the writing room of several television series, and you get to see some of that real stuff. But you know what? Here's what we're going to I didn't realize it's, it's noon already. Yeah. Here's, here's what I want to do. I'm going to crazily shorthand this process. We have three great beats for the con man. We have beats for our A story. I'm just going to throw out somebody said, well, actually, the con man to me is now like more of like almost a B story. Yeah. I'm going to write out a couple of cards for, let's say, a C story would be the mother, right? Because the mother is the character in this. And, well, go <laughs> with Amy's idea to see the mother <laughs> working in some sort of sex she's situation. Sex let's, let's, let's just write out a couple of beats and just say, let's say mother at hospital. I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to say mother at hospital, and I'm going to say, um, uh, while, while Jackie's off selling the cow, I'm going to say uh, mother starts drinking heavily. <laughs> <laughs> so here now this is the crazy this is this is to your point about how the process works. All right. Imagine, all right. So imagine rather than this incredibly cheap thing I got at Walmart last night, there is an enormous bulletin board or whiteboard. And we've been working out the A story. And that there's actually like 30 of these cards. And we say, okay. So here's what happens in the A story. We see this empty cupboard. There's nothing to eat. Um, oh my gosh, a banker comes to their little farmhouse and says, guess what? We're going to foreclose on you. Um, things get worse for Jackie when she goes out to milk Milky. And oh my gosh, Milky is out of milk. Um, and we cut to, now this has changed somewhat, but for the moment, at this point, we had talked about, oh, there's a father in St. Louis looking for work. This is going to change, but that's all right. Um, this moment of Jackie, oh, Milky's out of milk. Jackie, ever the optimist, we have this moment where Jackie's saying, oh, I love you so much, Milky. And we have this touching moment there. And then <laughs> after that, the mother says, sorry, you've got to sell Milky. You've got to sell the cow. And, and then the mother's horribly sick with uh, sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> Jackie, I'm too, I'm too sick. Um, you've got to take the cow to market. And Jackie meets the traveler with the beans. So we would be, now, I'll just imagine that this is our A story. There's a whole Bolton board that's full of like A story beats. And they're all in this color. So this is our A story. On a separate board, we would be constructing a, oh, thank you very much. That's so nice to you. I appreciate that. Nick is now banned. All right. So on, in a separate uh, board, we would say, we, this is a little bit easier. We say, OK, we've decided on this B story, this interesting B story of a con man. And that the, uh, we see this con man in St. Louis. Oh, and he's meeting up with the dad in St. Louis. This is really interesting. Now, here's the con man. Cons a rich person out of beans. Um, maybe we see that, and then maybe we see that we're just kind of jumping. You understand this is all sort of like jumping around. Um, this moment, this is fascinating moment of dad stuck in clouds. Presumably, there'd be some additional beats in here of see the con man with dad in St. Louis, see a giant beanstalk. In fact, I'll just say dad climbs up beanstalk. Um, Interesting parallel. Um, this is dad climbs up the beanstalk at some point. Um, and dad stuck in clouds. All right, so here, um, all right, so here are story beats for our B story. And then we have very, very brief little C story of the mother. She starts to drink, and she's, wait, actually, I think the pitch was actually that she is at the hospital, or at the doctor's, we'll say, getting word that, oh my gosh, this is bad, I'm really, this gonorrhea is acting up on me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not good. 
and she comes home and starts to drink. So um, this is such a crude miniaturization of this process. Yes, Amy. What, what if Milky was actually Jackie's sister who okay. worked as a wet nurse because her baby died and then dried up, and so she had to get sold into okay. sex work? <laughs> so, this, so, yes, brilliant idea. So so this is a good sea story. Yes. So, but for right now, because we're not running out of time. For right now. So, here's, so, what we've done, imagine this, that we've actually worked out an A story. We've worked out a B story. We've worked out a C story. Now we would do what's called the weave, where we weave together these cards to create the basic building blocks of our story. So in the weave, and this would be like the room and the showrunner would start saying, all right, what's our teaser? Let's see what the teaser is. Well, let's, and I'm just going to be arbitrary here for a minute. Uh, let's just say we start with this empty cupboard. There's nothing to eat. And then, because that's really our A story, you want to start with the A story. Not always, but generally you start with the A story. And maybe our teaser is like um, the bank comes. Oh my gosh, this is a nightmare. Now they're going to repossess the house. And now maybe we'll say we cut at the end of the teaser to seeing this con man. With, we, we somehow establish in here that the father, like the bank shows up. The mother says, oh my gosh, and dad went off to St. Louis to try to find work. Please, Mr. Banker, maybe you know, he'll find work. He'll, he'll rescue us. He really will. And then we last beat of the teaser, we see the dad falling prey to this con man and taking these magic beans. So it's like father like daughter. You can um, do that in the beginning, too. See, here's the thing. There's always choices. Yes, yeah. you can do this at the beginning. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say that because we want to focus on Jackie and the mother, we want to start with Jackie and the mother. Generally, we want to start with who your A story is, is on. Um, so now we start building out the story. So let's just say this is our teaser. Let me say, all right, so how does Act 1 start? Well, maybe Act 1 starts with this additional problem. Holy cow. Um, Milky's out of milk. Um, or we could, you know what, or we could start with, I'm looking at the C story. The mother's at the hospital. Maybe um, we have this whole sequence where, like, um, all right, now they're really in trouble. Milky's out of milk. Jackie's all alone. The mother's at the hospital. And it gets this bad news that she's really, really sick. Um, and now we cut to back to Jackie going, it's OK, Milky. You know, this is probably, you would probably combine these two scenes in reality. But for the sake of argument, you say, Jackie, it's OK. Milky, we'll figure this out. We'll figure this out. Maybe we cut to Jack, to the dad climbing the beanstalk. It's like, oh my gosh, this is not a good thing. So when you're doing this, is each one of these cards a scene or just a beat? So each one of these cards is, <laughs> this is a great question, uh, a, it is a scene, I will say that, with a proviso that it, you know, when I say the word beat, because you know, people use the word beat, uh, it, and it can be a little confusing. In general, a beat is a story event. It is, it is a scene, generally speaking. It can be confusing because it's also in stage directions. Sometimes it'll be used as another way for saying pause. Like, you know, mom, I'm pregnant. And then you might have action like a beat which sort of implies that there's a lot going so, on. And so you pause, yeah. Um, so that's a different use of the term. Um, a story beat, generally in a writer's room, in a TV writer's room, you say these are the beats of the story. Um, and to say that they are scenes, um, you know, for instance, like you could say this is two beats that might end up being one scene. Milky's out of milk, Jackie, this is not a great example, but Jackie says, oh, I love you, Milky, it's fine. Um, what I, I'm doing, and I'm going to sort of try to wrap up here, this is such a miniaturization of the whole thing, is you do this weave, so you can see what the idea is. You just put the cards together in a sequence that makes, seem to make sense. You're weaving together these story lines. The reason you use different colored cards is it's a visual reminder of, is, are you keeping this story alive? Um, in this case, we're doing a pretty good job of it. Sometimes you'll end up with an act and you go, wait a second, there's no 
uh, red cards in this act. We need to keep this mother's story alive. It's a great way to visually show how you keep the story alive. And to return to your question about, so what is the, how does this process work in terms of like, what is the showrunner's responsibility? The showrunner usually, not always, because sometimes they get incredibly busy, and she may have her second command run the writer's room. And you may end up with cases where you break out a whole story. This has happened often and most irritatingly. You break out a whole story. You've got it, you've woven it together. It's up on the board. It's all been done by the second in command. And then the showrunner comes in and says, uh, actually, what if Milky was another sex worker? <laughs> you know? And so, and so, and you throw it all out. So th that can happen. But in general, in a well-run show, like the, let's say the showrunner is present, the showrunner is making these choices. Um, all right, we're mapping out, we're breaking our story. I feel like I've got a good story broken out here. Um, in hour-long dramas, typically, what, one writer will write this episode. And oftentimes, it's the person who said, I have a great idea. What if the dad climbs up the beanstalk to the, I mean, I shouldn't say. It's, it's the person who pitches the original idea. You know, in this case, we're sort of doing this generic idea. But if, had I, let's say Amy. Amy had come in and said, I want to tell the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Let's say our series is not Jack and the Beanstalk, but our series is fairy tales. And she says, I want to do Jack and the Beanstalk. You say, great. The breaking of the story is very collaborative. It would be this writer's room thing where Amy would say, you know, well, I think she should be a sex worker. <coughs> and the showrunner says, no, no, I don't like that part. And um, it's a very collaborative process. But then, the next step in the process is now we have the story broken out on cards or on a whiteboard, but it's always broken out into beats and organized into acts. So that'll always be like, here's, <coughs> assuming our show has acts. I mean, for an HBO show or something, then there's just one long, you know, no, there are no act breaks. Even in those cases, you would typically construct it with acts, even if you don't take commercial breaks, mm -hmm. because it helps the dramatic structure. Um, so you, sorry, so now you have this story broken. Amy would then go off and take this basic structure and write an outline. So it'd be her episode, 101, Jackie and the Beanstalk, episode 101, and she'd write an outline. And there's various ways that showrunners like to do this. Some showrunners would say, just give me a beat sheet, um, like three or four pages that basically um, expands on these, you know, on these cards. Also, crucially, there is a writer's assistant who is typing down notes and typing down what everyone's saying. Um, and that's very, very helpful to the writer because the writer that has a written record of all these people's thoughts and can weave those into the outline. Um, typically, I would say, so sometimes it's beaches. More typically, like the classic way to do it, like the Jeff Melvoin way is, all right, so now you've broken the story out. The writer goes off and produces a 10 to 12 page outline that's fairly detailed. It takes each scene, it might sometimes interlace some dialogue, like we had pitches of dialogue, like what if the mom would say this? Um, it might tell you, it tells you what that scene really is. It uh, would include slug lines. You know, the slug line is the interior, exterior, where the scene is taking place in the time of day, day or night. Um, typically the outline will include slug lines. By the way, that's a tip I have to say is, always when you outline a script, people sometimes I don't, for whatever reason, don't include slug lines. Slug lines are a great friend because it forces you to say, where is this actually taking place? Like, you know, it's one thing to say, Jackie loves the cow. That scene could conceivably take place in a variety of settings. She could be in her room drawing a picture of the cow. She could be talking to her friend in the field. She could <coughs> be in the barn with the cow. A slug line forces you to say, what is the camera actually seeing? Because that's always your job, really, is to say, what, so what is the camera actually seeing right now? Um, so anyway, so Amy writes this 10 page to 12 page outline. Then the process continues with the showrunner, well typically, uh, the showrunner will give notes on the outline. 
the fellow writers in the writer's room will give suggestions for the outline. The only ones who really have to take are the showrunners. Um, and then this outline gets shown to the network, because the network's about to spend $3 million shooting an hour of television, and they want to know, well, what is it that we're going to be seeing? They may say, wait, a sex worker? No, 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 you can't do that. And you have to start all over. So you know, the process of getting notes is endless. But um, part of it is getting notes on the outline from the network. So get notes from the network, get notes from the showrunner, from your fellow writers. Take all those notes, you revise the outline, and then you give it to the showrunner again. In the ideal world, the showrunner says, yeah, OK, we're good to go now. Now go off and write the script. So now Amy goes off and typically has two weeks to write the script, which may sound like a short amount of time, but the, the hardest work has been done. This is writing. This is the thing I always want to say. People say you go off and write the script. The reality is this is writing. Breaking story is the hardest part of writing. You are writing when you break a story like this. Um, and so the writing of the actual screenplay, if you will, the TV script, is kind of the icing on the cake. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know, adhere to your outline like grim death, because this is what's been approved. And by the way, when your outline is approved, this is when you get your first payment. So it's, you know, uh, oftentimes you've had students kind of question the outline process. The outline is not even necessarily for you. It's so you can get paid. And so it's really important to, in, in the world of television anyway, I mean, if, if you're writing them, something on your own, it's a different matter. But if you're on TV staff, that triggers the first payment is when you get an outline. Um, anyway, Amy goes off, has two weeks, turns in a script, and now more notes. Again, the showrunner will give notes, the fellow writers will give notes. Now we have a director of the episode who will give notes, the network gives notes, and the studio gives notes. So now you have another round of notes that all have to be addressed. And here's where a showrunner's job also comes into play. Because the showrunner, like you'll have a script that the showrunner loves. The studio says, what, a sex worker? No, no, we can't have that. The showrunner is a very highly political position. The showrunner has to then either successfully lobby the network. No, no, no. It will, you'll love it. It's going to be like a, a sex worker with the heart of gold. Or you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be a dynamic character that people will write about uh, on blogs like Orange is the New Black. You know, um, it's the showrunner's job to sell the work to the network. Um, or say, OK. Um, we'll take that note and try to incorporate the note, or choose to take you know, their life in their hands and depending on how powerful you are, say thank you, I think we're gonna go another way. And then you can conceivably end up getting fired, but if you're fairly powerful and successful, chances are you won't. It's, it's a highly political, complicated tightrope that you walk as a showrunner. At any rate, all of these notes, the showrunner sort of sits down with Amy then and says, OK, here are the notes. Here are the ones I think we should address. And it's a discussion. And then Amy has maybe a day or two to um, turn the script around and address all those notes. And then it heads into production. And at the, at the moment it gets released to the actors, then you have a new round of notes. Because now the actors have their own actions to grind, typically which is, I'm not on screen enough. And what, I would never do that. I, you know, I don't want to portray a sex worker. Um, there's any number of things that you have to deal with from the actors. And the actors, unfortunately, or I shouldn't say unfortunately. You know, actors are the face of the show. For better or worse, you know, we're writers. We understand it's all about the writing. The general public just sees <laughs> these stars on their TV screens, and they assume that somehow these stars are magically making up words on the spot, you know? <laughs> and I, I, seriously, I've encountered people who really seemingly think that, well, it's, they just, they just I don't know what they think, but they, they don't seem to realize there's a script always, and that it's really, what they're seeing is a writer. By the way, this is something Roseanne Welch, our history teacher, always says that is really interesting. People oftentimes forget, you'll see people that will track through like director's careers, like, oh, the films of Hitchcock, or you know, the films of Woody Allen, or the films of you know, Truffaut or whatever, but track through a writer's career. 
particularly interesting in television. And like track through what Vince Gilligan did before, you know, Breaking Bad, which was X Files. I think you know track through, and you see the influences. Like you know Jeff Melvoin for me like started off on Northern Exposure, this interesting sort of imaginative show, and and or, or like you, if you want to really look at something interesting, look at the writing staff on Hill Street Blues, which birthed so many generations of television shows. Just go to IMDb and check out the writing staff of Hill Street Blues and you can sort of see the history of the late 20th century in television from, and just track what those writers went to and what, what they did from that point on. It's really, really interesting. Um, and then eventually the show gets, your episode 80's episode finally gets shot in eight days and things get butchered and that's what you want. And then it gets edited, and it finally ends up on television. But this is the beauty of television, is it does end up on television. You know, you have to shoot something every eight days. And so unlike screenplays, where you can you know, wait, you can, you've got a screenplay that's been sold, it's like, oh my gosh, when will this ever get into production? TV is like a machine. And, and imagine, and by the way, imagine this process in the world of TV. It's like you have these box cars on a train. So if you're the showrunner, let's say you're in the middle of the season. You have an episode at the far end that may be just airing that week. You have an episode that's like in the final stages of post-production, doing a couple of little ADR things or something. You have an episode that is still in editing, um, and, you have to, and you have to cover that edit. You have to make sure the edit is what you want it to be. You have an episode that it is, is being shot currently, and you have to be on top of the actors complaining about a script and saying, I want this rewritten. And, you know, and the network saying, wait, this isn't good. So you have that to deal with. You have the episode that's prepping to be shot next week. And so you have to be on top of all of that casting and the budget for what that's, you know, you want a special effect here, we're gonna have to give up something else. Um, you want to do, have an overage to get this guest star? Well, I don't know, what's the rest of my budget for the rest of the year? If I blow it here, will I have it to spend later? Um, so you have this prep going on for that show. You have a script that got turned in that you have to read and give notes on. Um, and then backing up a step further, you have an outline of the script coming down the pipe that you have to, again, read and give notes on. And then you have people in a room breaking the story that will end up being episode 11 or 12. So you can see the tension for a showrunner is, it's enormous. It's like you're controlling all of this. And it is like you, you have to be able to, to keep a million plates in the air at the same time. Um, and speaking of plates, yes, I think yes, it's yes, time for yes. lunch. And I will say, I just, so it's not on Netflix at the moment, but it is on Amazon Prime if you have Amazon. It's called Showrunners, The Art of Running a TV Show. And it's fascinating and stressful just to even watch it. <laughs> so, and, and by the way, you can see also, though, why it's so much fun to be in a writer's room, right? Because like this energy, like, oh wait, I got this idea, I got this idea. It is, and this is like with this goofy fairy tale. And so it's, um, it's why it's so much fun to end up in a writer's room, working with smart people like But you can still, here. with your writing partners, do this yes. on a screenplay or, you know, so it, it translates. Yes. It